I come from a family that died young. My grandfather was an Iowa corn farmer. My grandmother, a nurse at the local hospital. They had 11 children. My mother was the oldest. She had seven brothers. Six were born with the genetic bleeding disorder of hemophilia. It had never been in any other generation or any other family before. We were the first. It's interesting to note that after my mum was born, but before her brothers were born, they sprayed arsenic and lead on the corn and wheat fields through the Midwest because there was a locust plague. After that, DDT was sprayed, and it was sprayed right up until the time my sister was conceived. My sister was never well, and I often wonder, was it the DDT and the arsenic and lead that was sprayed that my mother was exposed to that may have caused her illnesses. At 16, she had digestive system problems. At 24, she was diagnosed with a devastating diagnosis of CREST, gave her 10 years to live, and it is an acronym for five autoimmune diseases. She died young. My mother also died young of lung cancer before her time. In my mother's family and the next couple of generations, we've had a lot of disease. Starting with mental illness, we have psychosis, schizophrenia, severe anxiety, depression, and suicide. We also have, in the autoimmune diseases, Raynaud's phenomena and type 1 diabetes, cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, as well as breast cancer and esophageal cancer. And then we have some weird ones like Bud Chiari and, and dysphagia. But the most devastating of all was in the 80s and 90s when HIV and AIDS broke out in the community. The CDC saw our family as the one that had been impacted the most by this disease. We lost eight family members due to blood transfusions. So I knew I didn't have a great gen genetic lottery, and I knew my epigenetics had a lot to be desired. So I decided to learn the art of prevention. I wasn't going to go down that same track. I studied nutrition, cultural anthropology, as well as human anatomy. And at the end of six years of study, and even more study on top of that, I knew what this evolutionary body needed. And it was totally against the dietary guidelines at the time. I disagreed with breakfast cereals, margarine, low fat. I disagreed with packaged foods and one calorie drinks. I realized what my body needed was the most amazing real foods. I wrote a book called Changing Habits, Changing Lives. And that book is what I lived by. It was about eating foods from scratch or making foods from scratch. I had a small pantry with real foods in it. I made everything in my kitchen. I fed my family exactly the same way. And I'm happy to tell you that I have three children that I brought up without one medication, not one antibiotic, not one anti-inflammatory or painkiller. And they're three healthy adults today. So I knew I was on the right track. So I was a little bit surprised at the age of 45 and moving towards my 50s that I started to get some ailments that were beginning to impact, impact on my life. I had lower back pain that was consistent. I had right hip pain that when I stood up, it was excruciating pain. I had tightness in my throat. All my joints and all of my muscles seemed to be tightening up. I had migraines, dry skin, dry hair, and I could go on. And so, as a nutritionist, I thought, well, let's look at food. So I eliminated everything from the diet except very small pieces of protein, large amounts of green vegetables, and a couple of fruits. And in three weeks, I managed to lose the weight that I'd been putting on, 20 pounds of weight. I managed to lose every symptom that I had, and I got unbelievable energy and clarity of mind that was just making me realize that there was something in what I was eating that was causing the problem. So I started to introduce foods back into the diet, and on day 10, I introduced wheat, and all my symptoms came flooding back. But I'd done cultural anthropology at school. I knew the, the social impact and the evolutionary impact of grain and wheat. I knew that my Australian Aboriginal people had been grain growers and makers of bread for at least 65,000 years, and, and the Northern Hemisphere for at least 20,000 years. So why was wheat a problem? I was seeing more and more people with wheat issues 
but I had eaten well. So I went on a bit of a research binge and I started to look at what had happened to wheat from the beginning of this last century, the 1920s, right through to now. So for the last 100 years. I created a documentary, I wrote the documentary called What's With Wheat? And this is what I found. Is that we started to refine the wheat grain. We took the germ out, we took the bran out, and we replaced it with synthetic vitamins and mined minerals. We stopped preparing our wheat the way we used to. We used to ferment it or soak it and long cook it. So that all changed. We were growing a lot of it. So therefore, it was in everything. It's in every meal. It's in 75% of packaged foods. Not only is wheat, but it could be an additive, a preservative, a flavoring, a filler, a starch, a binder. It's also an excipient in our medications and our vitamins and minerals. It's also the beginning of ascorbic acid. So wheat is all in our cosmetics, it's in our makeups, it's in our personal care products, our shampoos, our conditioners. So we're exposed to it continuously. It's been hybridized. But I think the most telling of all things is our agricultural practices. We can spray 10 chemicals on the wheat field from before it's sown right through to the silo. But the, the practice that I think has been the most of impact to wheat and why we're seeing an increase in problems is the drying of the crop a couple of weeks before harvest. And it's done using a chemical. We also do this to our legumes, other grains, um, through, through vineyards. Um, it will be sprayed on the same chemical. It can be sprayed through nut fields and um, fruit, fruit um, trees. So this chemical is called glyphosate. And glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. So it's also sprayed on our genetically modified Roundup Ready foods. So it has five patents on it, or sorry, four patents on it. And the patents are, the first one was it was a chelating agent. And that was done in 1964. From a chelating agent, it then became a herbicide, so it killed plants. Then it became an antiparasitic, antimicrobial patent. And the last patent in 2010 was a biocide. So what does that mean? Well, that means when we put it on the land, it kills the ecology of the soil, the microorganisms in the soil that help our beautiful plants pull up their minerals to make them strong. And if that chemical is on our food, what it does to us is it slowly erodes that ecology in our gut, that microbiome that helps us digest our food, helps us make vitamins, helps us with our immune system and many other um, things it does for the human body. We live symbiotically with it. So when you see this, these things happening, you're also seeing an increase in celiac disease, wheat allergy, other food allergies, fructose malabsorption, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, as well as we're seeing autoimmune diseases that are related to gluten. So what can we do about it? I think the most important thing that we need to do is that we need to understand how our foods are produced. Look at the agriculture of our foods. Go back to your farmer's markets. Find out what are your farmers doing with their foods? What chemicals are they spraying or not spraying? I also think if wheat may be an issue, then go off wheat for six weeks and see if your symptoms improve. And finally, we need to get back in the kitchen to nurture and nourish our family and also to feed them, but to heal a nation. And then we may be able to create a tsunami of change as individuals together that will change the health of ourselves, our children, and future generations. And this, I believe, is information worth sharing.